Well, this is going to be a very long but hopefully informative video. As you all know by now, Afghanistan has fallen to the Taliban. Now, this brings an end to a nearly 20-year-long war. 20 years. We were there for almost two decades, and the outcome is disastrous. It was all for nothing. And I think that this proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that the United States military is incapable of competently spreading democracy or building other nations. So let this serve as a reminder to you the next time you see government officials or mainstream media beating the war drums against another country, be it Venezuela or Bolivia, remember that this is always the outcome. We do not help we make matters worse. But before I share my opinion on the situation and some takeaways that I think are the most important here, I do want to give you a general overview of what's taking place. So here's a quick clip from Democracy Now! Uh, with a very, uh, you know, broad rundown of what's happening. Over the past 10 days, the Taliban has captured 26 out of Afghanistan's 34 provincial capitals. Some fell without a fight after the Taliban reached deals with local warlords. The Taliban offensive came as the United States is withdrawing its troops from Afghanistan after nearly two decades of war and occupation. The Biden administration is now rushing to send an additional 1,000 troops to Afghanistan to help evacuate U.S. citizens and allies. The total size of the U.S. force will soon be 6,000. U.S. troops have taken control of the international airport in Kabul, while thousands of Afghan civilians are hoping to flee Taliban rule. The U.S. has canceled all commercial flights. Video went viral this morning of hundreds of Afghans running alongside and trying to grab onto a U.S. Air Force jet as it attempted to take off. At least three people died after falling to their deaths while clinging on to a U.S. plane. Another died on the tarmac. Over 60 nations, including the United States, have joined together to urge the Taliban to protect foreign nationals and Afghans who want to leave Afghanistan out of fear the Taliban will again brutally control the country like it did between 1996 and 2001, before the U.S. invasion. Now, I'm not going to play the video clips of people falling from the airplanes, because that's that's just too much. Um, you know, you don't need to see that to acknowledge that the situation is really, really terrible. It's gut-wrenching, you know, to see these types of videos of people fleeing to get to the airport, to uh, run away from Taliban rule. Um, but I do want to give you some additional details. This is from Brett Wilkins of Common Dreams, who explains, The stunning but predictable Taliban reconquest of Afghanistan marks the end of the nearly 20-year U.S.-led war that caused lost the lives of more than 200,000 Afghans, displaced over 5 million more, and diverted at least 2 trillion in American taxpayer funds that progressive critics said could have been better spent on programs of domestic and international social uplift and well-being. And that paragraph is important because essentially, um, in a nutshell, it really paints this picture that we spent all of this money, all of this time and effort, and it was all basically for nothing. The second we leave, the Taliban takes over. Now, if you're wondering what Afghanistan is going to look like under Taliban rule, where, well, they actually, uh, they did control Afghanistan prior to our invasion. Uh, but if you want, you know, a more clear picture, I would say it's probably going to resemble the most conservative regions of Saudi Arabia. Not that Saudi Arabia isn't, you know, entirely a very dictatorial, totalitarian theocracy. But there are some areas in Saudi Arabia, such as Riyadh, for example, where women don't cover their entire face, like they just cover their hair, but their faces show. Uh, but, you know, in more conservative regions, they're forced to wear burqas. They're not allowed to leave without a male companion. And I think that most of Afghanistan is going to resemble the most conservative regions of Saudi Arabia. You know, women's rights will not be respected. LGBTQ uh, people will essentially be... Um, wiped out of existence, if they don't go back into the closet, if they were already out, they will be likely killed. It is gut-wrenching to see the situation. But in terms of what it looks like right now, a CNN reporter on the ground in Kabul right now, Clarissa Ward, kind of paints a picture. And, you know, right now, not much has changed as of yet, but it's 
fairly ominous. Mainly on the street, I would say it's Taliban, and it's it's hard to show you, but they're literally everywhere. They're over there, they're over there, they're over there, they're everywhere. Uh, and that's how they're able to implement force, uh, implement security, because people are so scared of them. No one is going to fight the Taliban. Then you also have some men on the streets, you have some kids. I have seen a few women, but I will say I have seen far fewer women than I would ordinarily see walking down the streets of Kabul. And the women that you do see walking down the streets of Kabul tend to be dressed more conservatively than they were when they were walking down the streets of Kabul yesterday. I've seen more burqas today than I had seen in a while. Obviously, I am dressed in a very different way to how I would normally dress to walk down the streets of Kabul. So there's a lot of children as well. I think they're more curious than anything else. And you know, it's important to remember as well, the Taliban does have, to many people, this bizarre sort of mystique, John. People are intrigued by them. Some people here genuinely see them as heroes. And so it's a very odd cocktail that you find on the streets of Kabul with so many people hiding and other people peeking out to see what comes next and nobody really knowing what on earth to expect. Now, prior to the Taliban seizing control, this is what Biden said when he was asked about the likelihood that something like this would transpire. Needless to say, his response did not age very well. Is a Taliban takeover of Afghanistan now inevitable? No, it is not. Why? Because you have the Afghan troops have 300,000 well-equipped, as well-equipped as any army in the world and an Air Force against something like 75,000 Taliban. It is not inevitable. But the likelihood there's going to be the Taliban overrunning everything and owning the whole country is highly unlikely. Now, maybe he got bad intelligence. Maybe he's just, you know, a little bit too optimistic or naive. I think that that answer right there was awful because now he looks terrible. He looks incompetent. And to a degree, I think that there is a lot of blame to be attributed to the Biden administration. I think that right there when he was asked that, he should have acknowledged the reality that this could happen, but still made the case nonetheless for withdrawal because a lot of people saw this coming. I mean, veterans on the ground who served in Afghanistan knew that the second they left, this was going to happen. So Biden should never have, you know, had tried to paint this overly rosy picture. He should have just been realistic. Now, after some time of silence after the Taliban uh, retook Kabul, he gave a different response. This is as of today, and this is what he's saying now. I'm now the fourth American president to preside over war in Afghanistan, two Democrats and two Republicans. I will not pass this responsibly on, responsibility on to a fifth president. I will not mislead the American people by claiming that just a little more time in Afghanistan will make all the difference nor will I shrink from my share of responsibility for where we are today and how we must move forward from here. I am president of the United States of America, and the buck stops with me. I'm deeply saddened by the facts we now face, but I do not regret my decision to end America's war fighting in Afghanistan and maintain a laser focus on our counterterrorism missions there and other parts of the world. Now, I actually think that was a very solid response from Joe Biden. He took responsibility for what's happening, as he should, because he's the president and the buck does stop with him. But additionally, he remained committed to withdrawing. Because here's the thing, staying there indefinitely was never something that was feasible. We can't occupy Afghanistan until the end of time. But having said that, Regardless, if we withdrew in 2015, if we would withdraw, you know, right now or in 2030, this was inevitable. It was always going to happen. It was always going to happen. So even though this is a really hard decision, ultimately, I do think that Biden made the right decision in withdrawing. And I'm glad that he is remain, remaining firm in uh, his his decision. Because the media is going to say, hey, look, this is this is horrible. All of this bloodshed is on you. We shouldn't have withdrawn. But that's the wrong takeaway, ultimately. Yes, it is very sad to see what is happening. It's gut-wrenching to see the people of Afghanistan flee. Uh, but 
what do we do? What's the alternative? And, and that's what we really don't get from the mainstream media. We don't hear an alternative perspective. There is no alternative. Either you stay there forever or you acknowledge the reality that the Taliban would ultimately take over Afghanistan. The best that you can do ultimately is get the people out who assisted us there. Any interpreters who were promised uh, you know, asylum, uh, anyone who contracted with the United States government, make sure that they're out so that way they won't be vulnerable under the Taliban rule who will view them as traitors. Now, currently the, the Taliban is saying, you know what, we're, we're not going to prosecute anyone who worked with the U.S. government, but obviously I don't necessarily think that their word is, is very valuable. So we have to make sure that we get people out. We'll talk about that in a second. But Barbara Lee also agrees here that withdrawing is the option, the only option, <laughs> because unfortunately there's, there's just no military solution to Afghanistan. This is the inevitable outcome, unfortunately, and it's horrible. We don't have to feel numb to the pain and suffering that we're witnessing right now, but this was something that was always going to happen. It's just a matter of whether or not it's going to happen now or later on down the line. This is what uh, Barbara Lee had to say in an interview with an MSNBC host. Congresswoman Lee, as you know, the war in Afghanistan is the longest war in U.S. history. Today, from your point of view, is it safe to say America has lost that war? What I'm going to say is this, uh, first of all, nice being with you, is that our focus and priority has got to be now the safety and security of the American citizens, our diplomats, uh, the Afghans, our allies, so many people who supported the American operation there. And so we have to focus on the visas. We have to focus on women and children, the safety and security of everyone at this moment. And I think it's a very dire situation. This has got to be, and it is, an all-hands-on-deck operation, a whole government operation. And this is uh, an example, though, that there is no military solution, unfortunately, in Afghanistan. We've been there 20 years. We have spent over a trillion dollars, and we have trained over 300,000 of uh, the Afghan forces. So I think the president is absolutely correct. Uh, Secretary of State, Secretary Austin have laid this out, and it's very difficult. It's very hard. This is a tragedy, and so we have to make sure that we focus and make a top priority getting people to safety. And she's correct. There is no military solution, unfortunately, in Afghanistan, which is why she was very adamant about us not going in there to begin with. Because what's the goal? What are we going to do there? We're not feasibly going to construct a government that's going to last. We're not going to be able to build a democracy. It's just not going to happen. So why are we there? Well, I mean, <laughs> we're there because this is profitable. Staying in Afghanistan as long as we possibly can is very profitable to the military industrial complex. On top of that, you know, we were raiding Afghanistan of their mineral uh, resources. So, you know, I, I think that ultimately it is correct that withdrawing is the right decision. But even having said that, though, even if I agree with Biden's decision ultimately and overall, I do think that he absolutely is bungling the uh, situation as it relates to refugees um, because he should have had some system in place. You know, the U.S. military generals should have anticipated a, a Taliban takeover and had, you know, a, a plan B, a plan C in the event this happened. But it seemed as if there really wasn't any plan in place, as Clarissa Ward of CNN reports. The problem you have now, there's definitely no plan in place to try to evacuate these people safely. OK, the U.S. is really barely able to keep a hold on the situation at the airport right now, let alone trying to extend some kind of uh, corridor for people to leave through. So that is simply out of the question. The other problem you have is that there's this crush of humanity descending on the airport. Uh, vehicles clogging both lanes of traffic, scenes of, of people firing in the air to stop a sort of stampede almost. People have been shot by stray bullets. It's, it's absolute pandemonium at the airport. And if you don't have your visa ready, if you don't have your passport ready, because a lot of people were trying to prepare for this moment, Brianna, we saw it yesterday, long lines outside the passport office, but no one imagine that it would happen this quickly, that they would have a matter of hours 
to pack up their lives, get together their paperwork, book a ticket, get to the airport. I mean, it's completely unfeasible for the vast majority of Afghans. And so they are now left in this desperate situation, petrified for their lives. They are being assured officially by the Taliban that there is a blanket amnesty even for people who worked with the government, even for people who worked with security forces. But it doesn't take a genius to realize that for a lot of people, they're too scared to believe that. They have huge reservations. And so they are now hunkered down, waiting for more clarity, waiting for more guidance from the U.S. as to how their paperwork will be expedited, how they can get safely out of the country. And in this moment, there's not a huge amount of information coming through to them. So it's a desperate situation. So, I mean, this speaks to the incompetence of the United States government. And right now, priority number one, which everyone should be focused on, is getting as many people out as possible. We need to accept lots and lots of refugees. Anyone who wants to apply for asylum should be allowed to do that. Because this is our fault. Any other country, any Western country that intervened in Afghanistan, they should be opening up their doors to Afghanistan refugees. And especially, we have to make sure that U.S. allies in Afghanistan get out because they are the most vulnerable. And we also have to make sure that we prioritize marginalized groups. As Dave New World points out, there are 250 female judges in Afghanistan who will be killed if we don't grant them a special visa to get them out. This should be bigger news. The last time the Taliban took control, they targeted judges because a female judge is everything that goes against Taliban philosophy. And now because we went in there, the Taliban is stronger than ever. We trained hundreds of thousands of Afghani fighters, which now are likely going to be part of the Taliban, like it or not. And all those weapons that we gave to Afghan fighters, that's all going to go to the Taliban. So because of our intervention, the Taliban is stronger than ever. So I think we are absolutely morally obligated to get as many people out as possible. And for the individuals who don't want to come to the United States, if they want to flee to a neighboring country, I think we have to give them reparations, pay money to every single individual whose lives we ruined. And it's a big population. But I mean, this is this is what happens when you intervene. You ruin lives and you have to right that wrong. You have to fix what you fucked up. You have to make sure that you offer them a home in the United States because we did this. So now currently neocons and warmongers, war profiteers, you know, members of the military industrial complex, they are currently patting themselves on the back as if, you know, they were proven correct that, you know, staying indefinitely was the better option. Certainly we should have not pulled out because if we didn't pull out, then none of this would have been happening. But again, I want people to push back on that narrative by saying, no, 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 it's not the neocons who are right. It's the anti-war leftists who are correct, because they're the ones who from the get go said this was never a good idea to intervene. Barbara Lee, for example, who in 2001, as Kumar Rowe shared, said we must be careful to not embark on an open ended war with neither an exit strategy nor a focused target. We cannot repeat past mistakes. And that's correct. The bottom line is that our presence there made matters worse. Us being there is a net negative. And if we stayed in longer, that's not going to change the situation. Whenever we leave, the Taliban is going to take control. But let this serve as a reminder to us that war is never the option because we may think that we know what's best for a country. We might think that there's a humane reason for intervening, but that is never the case. A humanitarian war is never the case. Because understand that, uh, you know, the U United States government, our media establishment, they never focus on humanitarian issues unless it serves their war profiteering purposes. I mean, we can focus on North Korea and Saudi Arabia and all of the human rights abuses there, but intervening in those countries is never an option because, of course, Saudi Arabia is our ally and it would just be too big of a disaster if we intervened in North Korea. But we focus on these humanitarian crises where the military industrial complex sees an opportunity, an opportunity to act 
to try to, you know, cultivate sympathy for the suffering people of these countries. And I think it's absolutely important that we do feel sympathy for these individuals. It is natural and human to feel terrible and sad for the people of Afghanistan who are fleeing currently. But don't let war profiteers use your sympathy as a justification for more wars that only lines their pockets because the Americans who served in Afghanistan, they saw firsthand that this was never a winnable war. So this is from Jolly Good Ginger who says, as a veteran of the Afghanistan war and as a citizen of the United States, I feel physically sick to my stomach watching the Taliban take over. I feel sadness for the people fleeing to avoid the terror that brings. But one thing I don't feel, I don't feel shock, not a solitary ounce of shock. We all knew we were spinning our wheels over there. It was a giant ploy by rich men to get richer, while me and other poor men and women paid the price of capitalism with our lives, our minds, and our bodies. So my message to America, as we watch the Taliban take Afghanistan back, is this. Feel shame. We deserve it. Feel angry. Not at the Taliban. No, at the oligarchy that controls this country that willingly sends off our sons and daughters to pay in blood for their capitalist dreams. Exactly. We should all feel sad and ashamed because of what's happening. Our government did this. So when you hear, you know, these neocon warmongers go on mainstream media and try to convince you that it was a bad idea to leave and, you know, try to build up the case for more never-ending wars. Acknowledge that they never care about the human suffering. They never care about the death toll. They don't. They don't ever acknowledge the cost in human lives and the monetary cost that these wars have. They have one goal and one goal only. Propagate this military-industrial complex by doing never-ending wars. That is the most profitable solution. And another veteran echoed that same sentiment from Jolly Good Ginger. So this is from Laura Jadid who explains, boy, howdy, am I having a lot of feelings about Afghanistan today? I deployed there twice, once in 2008 and once in 2009 to 10. It was already obvious that the Taliban would sweep through the very instant we left. And here we are today. I know how bad the Taliban is. I know what they do to women and little boys. I know what they're going to do to the interpreters and the people who cooperated with us. It's awful. It's bad, but we are leaving. And all I feel is grim relief. I am team get the fuck out of Afghanistan, which as a friend point it out to me today has always been team taliban it's team taliban or team stay forever there is no third team so i'm sitting here reading these sad fucking tweets about the suffering in afghanistan and the horror of the encroaching taliban and how awful it is that this is happening but i can't stop feeling this grim happiness like finally you fuckers finally you have to see it too no more blown up soldiers no more bollywood videos on phones whose owners are getting shipped god knows where no more hypocrisy. No more pretending it meant anything. It didn't. It didn't mean a fucking thing. And that's just that. All of this money, all of the suffering, deaths of Afghanistan civilians, and what has it led to? We're back to where we started, except the Taliban now is stronger than they were before we invaded. It's just... What a disgusting situation, and really, this shouldn't make anyone think instinctively, well, man, it just looks like the United States government, we need to expand our presence. No, that should not be the takeaway. The takeaway should be, we need to stay away from other countries. We cannot be the world's police, even if we wanted to be the world's police. We don't know what we're doing, and when we have actors from the military-industrial complex, not necessarily motivated by compassion and empathy, but instead motivated by money, this is always going to be the outcome of our wars. Now, finally, I'll leave you with this tweet from Rana Abdel Hamid, who tweets, I was nine years old when I watched my congresswoman wear a burqa in Congress to justify the invasion of Afghanistan. For the rest of my life, I knew that as a Muslim woman, my identity would be weaponized to justify American wars. 20 years of war later, what did we accomplish? What did we accomplish? If we stood there for five years more, 10 years more, another 20 years, would that change the outcome? No. So the takeaway of this video isn't just that I think that Biden made the necessary, albeit really difficult decision to withdraw knowing what would happen, but it's that we should never allow our government to do this again. You know, years are going to pass and there's going to be a new administration that may beat the war drums for Iran. 
Biden, for example, is very hawkish as it relates to Venezuela. Most of the Democratic Party is in lockstep with the military industrial complex when it comes to Venezuela. They also have a lot of oil wealth. But again, remember, the minute that our establishment, the political establishment, government, media starts beating the war drums against another country, this is always going to be the outcome. We're always going to make matters worse. And if we don't, it's the exception. It's the exception. World War II, for example. But overall, going to war with another country, we're not, we're not needed. We're going to make matters worse. Because we don't care about human lives. We care about money. That's why these never-ending wars happen. Because it's profitable. So I'm glad that Joe Biden did the right thing and decided to withdraw. But I want people to learn the right lessons from Afghanistan and understand what's going on and why things like this are happening.